Hey everyone, I'm Trey Bennett, nurse practitioner with IHPKC, and I'm excited today to talk with John Kohler. His story is sure to inspire, and it's perfect timing because this week is Men's Health Week. Uh, John is a father, a husband, a superhuman ultra runner, and but he hasn't always been a runner. So, John, thanks for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, sure. It's always fun. Yes. So um, years ago, I wrote my first blog ever about you, and uh, now we're doing first interview ever. So I'm pretty excited. Yeah. So it's cool. Yeah. So tell me. It's an honor, um, man. Tell me more about what inspired you to get healthier. So uh, my wife and I were talking about um, starting a family, and um, you know, one of the first things that. Uh, figure I would do is check up get healthy make sure that I was in good shape to uh, be a father to uh, chase my kids around and uh, make sure I was gonna be around, around for the long haul that's and, awesome yes yeah and so you know really it's my kids who who really started this even before they were born uh, I've often tell people that my kids both and, and at different points, you know, that, I mean, they really saved my life as far as through my health um, and inspiring me just to be, take care of myself, you know, be a better human. Yes. Very cool. Yeah. My dad, um, I, I don't think I've ever discussed this with you, but my dad, uh, when I was born, he actually quit smoking cold turkey. And then later when I was a young boy, he, uh, he quit drinking at that point. And he, he was, um, you know, sober for, I think, 25 or 30 years. So, wow. Um, yeah, and that was, you know, I was, um, I was, a, I was a pretty heavy smoker. Um, I, I, and I had definitely like to, uh, to drink my, my fair share. Um, and I obviously, I cut that out pretty quick, so. Yes. Um, so have you ever thought about the fact that, um, it kind of, in my mind, it kind of sounds like, uh, you know, I listened to that podcast was once the Wisconsin notes podcast about how, uh, you were talking about how you fell hard after your, uh, you were hooked hard after your first marathon. Have you ever thought about the fact that, um, in a way you kind of, perhaps um, kind of swapped an unhealthy habit or addiction for a health promoting one and, and uh, which spurred your, your running career here? Yeah, I do think about that a lot. Yeah. You know, both uh, were, I guess you could argue both are vices. Um, <laughs> my running vice is, uh, is, obviously a lot healthier than uh, than the smoking and the drinking and you know that type of stuff uh, but it is you know there is a parallel there uh, and uh, obviously I'm glad I switched tracks yes definitely it, um, so it's cracking me up I was listening to that podcast today and you were talking about how um, your wife and you uh, kind of consider running to be somewhat of a mistress <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that takes you away at times and ha has swept you up and taken you away. <laughs> yeah, you know, after, so after um, right before my kids were born, uh, I I did my first race, which happened to be a marathon, and like you say, I was hooked. And just slowly over time, it it uh, it escalated. You know, right. it was a marathon, and then. It, I did back-to-back -back marathons and then you know it just kind of gradually went up from there and then I woke up one day and it was like man you know it's work family and running and and yep. yeah you know sometimes it's it's uh it's it's taken on its own um, personality so right. um but you know the family has done my wife's amazing. My kids are amazing. Um, they've, they've adapted to it. We've all adapted to it. You know, I do my best to get it done early in the mornings or to not impede in anything that's going on at home. 
Um, that isn't always the case. I mean, there are days, you know, you just don't sleep well or whatever. And then you kind of end up, um, you know, um, having to reschedule everything. Yes. And so, um, you know, we make it work. They're good. Every. Yeah, that's good, awesome. So, so uh, what I really like about your story is that you found your inner athlete and you just took that and ran with it quite literally. Um, but I think what's really interesting is that we all have a sport that we enjoy. We just have to find it. You know, I've, I've um, been a fan of mountain biking, uh, kayaking, rock climbing. You know, we've had phases. I know you had a rock climbing phase. We, we need to uh, re-up the rock climbing phase yeah. at ROKC. The kids right. will love that too, yeah. Um, but I, I, I try to talk to patients a lot about that too, kind of finding that inner athlete. What are the things, what are the types of exercise that you used to like doing? And let's see if we can kind of rekindle that flame and get people... Uh, back to the point where exercise isn't work because that's the that's the end goal is to actually enjoy exercise and get as much out of exercise as you put in or if not more I mean you've talked about the things that um, we'll talk about that later but kind of the gifts that running has given you but um, so you so you started uh, tell us about your first marathon. I thought that was kind of funny how um, how that how that played out. Yeah, so uh, I trained. Well, I was working out on an elliptical in my garage. That's how I really first started into. I, I, I started getting back active. Um, I was mm-hmm. overweight, um, and so I was just. It was a mere like calculation i knew calories going in versus calories coming out i mean to lose weight it's got to be a negative number uh and so what i was really doing is i would just get on the uh, elliptical in my garage and just crank it um and then i had a friend who's uh was joining a uh, kind of a marathon team they're raising money for a fallen uh, firefighter excuse me here in kansas city and he said, hey, I'm running a marathon. How about you join, you know? And uh, really long story short, my wife volunteered me. And next thing you know, I'm training uh, over the summer for my first race. And, you know, the training, it, it went well. I wasn't really at that point, I wasn't a, a hooked or, or an addict or anything. I mean, it just, it was just a way for me to continue to lose the weight. Uh, and so we did the race and the guys that I was with, they were like, Hey, you know, you look really good. Why don't you go ahead? Uh, I ended up finishing. I felt like, um, I mean, I just felt like a million bucks and that was really when it hit me was just the accumulation of all the training, you know, those endorphins. Uh, and then we went to breakfast that next door after the race and I was sitting there thinking, and I had been doing some reading, and that was really when my love also started to develop for the ultra running world. And I knew that Boston had a lot of history, and I just, I don't know, I just knew that I could get there. And I remember telling somebody at breakfast, actually everybody there at breakfast, and just being like, they're like, oh, what's next? You know, you, you're done. You've done this. Like, that's check mark, bucket list type deal. And I was like, I think I can do Boston. And everybody just looked at me like I was crazy. I mean, I would have, I had to shave off 40 minutes, 40 plus minutes, um, which, you know, considering it was my first, it's nothing out of the ordinary. But I mean, if you just look at it, it's like, man, that's a lot of time to shave off. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and so that was the goal. And so at that point it was every day thereafter I was hooked and it was, I mean, I literally, it's like you said, you got to find something that you're passionate about, you know, and I feel like, and not to get askew, but I feel like a lot of just anything we do in life, it's about finding your passion. It's about trying new things, you know, we're always told to be, um, 
a master of one thing instead of a jack of all trades when really you need to experience everything and eventually you'll find what it is that you love to do, whether it's, you know, in your career, whether it's on your personal life, your, you know, your hobbies. And so for me, I just got lucky that I found it right from the get go. Uh, yes. And so it consumed me. I mean, this is where we get into the whole mistress thing, but it really was, I mean, I breathed it. I would, everything I ate, it was knowing that that was going to get me to Boston. Every you know, second of sleep every early morning. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of cheesy, but it's not. I mean, I just, I knew that's where I wanted to be. So I just honed in and, and it helped that I love to run, you know, for somebody who doesn't enjoy running one, you're not going to stick to it. And two, you're going to hate it. And you know, you're actually going to probably have the opposite intended effect. Um, right. And so, yeah, then what was it? A year later, I qualified and um, that was 2013. And we know the history behind 2013 in Boston and um, went through that with the whole family and I'm not going to bore everybody with the details, but, you know, we were there and we were close. And then at that point, I really had a connection with the city and my family did. And so I went back and I did um, Boston in 14, 15, 16, and 17. I think I did it five years. So 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Yeah. Um, because I just love the race so much. I mean, and for anybody who's done it or anybody that aspires to do it, it is everything it's cut up to be in more. I mean, it's just a beautiful place. Uh, not many other races in the world that you know probably match that so um you know you've got people from the beginning of the race to the very very end of the race and it's a holiday so kids are there um, everybody's handing stuff out um, i mean you know you hit something called heartbreak hill which is one of the more difficult parts of the race and it's just complete insanity. Uh, the history associated with it is great. I mean, it's, it's really, you line up with the, pro, with the pros and um, it's, it's crazy, but I mean, you feel like a professional. I mean, I, I've never been and I never will be a professional runner, but I imagine that's, that's probably as close as, you know, you can get. And it feels like it. I mean, it's just the town's electric that whole weekend um, you know if you're wearing your Boston stuff strangers will come up to you hey good luck on Monday uh, so yeah I mean it's 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 just a beautiful thing so very cool uh, yeah my partner Dr. Showalter has actually run Boston a few times and nice uh, yeah once recently in his 70s actually I was pretty impressed do you uh, uh, do you see yourself running running into your 70s running that long what do you think? If I'm lucky, yeah, I mean, I hope so. You know, I think that um, jokingly, I tell my friends that I hope to always be in marathon shape. You know, any, any given day, I would hope that to me, the ideal shape for me as I get older is that I could tow a, a, a marathon starting line. Uh, and I might not run my fastest time but I'd finish and I'd be in okay shape and, you know, I'd live through it. So to me, as I get older, that's really, to me, uh, that's, that's the focus. That's where I want to be. Um, but you know, awesome. things change. And so, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. All right. Set those goals high. There you go. Right. Um, yeah. All right. So where did you hear about November project? And, uh, we'll, let's talk a little bit more about MPKC. Right. So while uh, after 2013 went down, um, became friends with a lot of people uh, through another organization that was raising money for the victims. It was a relay across the United States. So mm -hmm. came friends via social media from, you know, California all the way to Massachusetts. And the, my Boston friends were posting these workouts at Harvard Stadium. Mm -hmm. and you know the 
pictures were just crazy, the sunrise, and it was my kind of people, you know, if, if you know me or if you, if you ever see me train, there is no weather that stops me. I will wake up at 5 a.m. and run in the snow. You know, I will run at 2 in the morning if that's the only time I can get it in. Um, obviously, 100-mile races, you run all night. I mean, I'm pretty – I feel like that uh, really helps prepare you for the unexpected in a race. Mm -hmm. And so I was watching these people train through winter, and the Boston winters are brutal and the snow and everything else. And I was like, man, those are my kind of people. Awesome. Uh, and, and so I started to dig into it and it's, it's, uh, it was a couple of guys who started working out in Boston. They were former rowers and they graduated from college and it was a way for them to stay in shape. So they said, Hey, let's just meet at Harvard. Let's hit the stairs. And it's turned into this huge global movement, uh, to get our communities together, tighten it, um, just through working out and, you know, kind of bringing that bond together within the, the community and so I had watched it from afar for a while and they opened up um, an opportunity that if you would like to start one in your city apply you know show us that you, you can do it I figure nobody's gonna do it nobody's done it so what the hell and uh, I was fortunate enough that uh, people throughout the community came people like you and yep. you know joined and really supported the the whole thing and so we are on your number four uh working out at the memorial every wednesday um and i no longer lead the group i kind of stepped down my kids were getting a little older and it, right. it's just a huge time commitment i mean it's all volunteer work yes. and um, so it was taking away from the family. And, um, so I stepped down, I think it's gosh, almost two years ago. Uh, but, uh, I'll be there next week and I go when I can. And so That's awesome. still a lot of fun. Yeah. You definitely yeah. inspired me to get fit through NPKC. Uh -huh. And I, I remember, um, way back then when I was going, um, I was trying to become a morning person. I, I still, I'm still trying to become a morning person. But <laughs> me too. Uh, me too. <laughs> uh, but you, you actually taught me how to do my first burpee. I'm pretty sure at, at NPKC. So that was pretty nice. Awesome. That is cool. <laughs> yeah. And what really amazed me about NPKC was the mix of ages and activity levels that showed up and everyone just is just so supportive. Um, everyone's kind of coaching everyone, uh, you can do this, you know, and you get your stairs for breakfast and, and it's, uh, it's just really an inspiring, cool group. I tell all kinds of people, patients and, uh, everyone who'll listen about it. Um, so yeah, it's, it was really cool. And you guys, I think, I can't remember if it was you or Dustin, but one time after one of those workouts, uh, one of you guys introduced me to the Ritual podcast, and I know you had run, uh, you had read his book, uh, Finding Ultra. It's, I, I believe, right? Correct. Yep, yep, yep. Oh yeah, I've got it on my bookshelf. Still haven't read it, but uh, but his podcast has been an amazing source of entertainment and inspiration for me. And uh, so, I was wondering, do you have any? Any clue, any idea of how many people have come through NPKC over the years? I mean, it's got to be, what, hundreds, thousands? I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd say we're probably close to thousands at least. Right. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you constantly have a mix of folks. And it's exactly like you said. I'm glad you brought it up. It's, it's, it's not, I mean, it's, it's all types of, fitness levels age groups i mean we have joe who's i think 77 he comes every single week awesome. and that guy crushes it have people that are you know they're ex-college athletes uh we have some, some semi-pro people we have women from the semi-pro uh female football league here in town they would wow. come to our workouts um, so we've had a great mix of people, which is great because, you know, especially in times like 
like this that we're going through right now. Uh, just a way to really connect people in an unartificial manner. Um, it's yes. just natural. We all find that, uh, you know, we love to sweat together and hang out. And, um, you know, we acknowledge each other's differences for sure. But at the same time, like, you know, we're there to work out. We're there to um, have a little community and then all leaving, which is, you know, it's the, so. Yeah, it, it was really cool. Um, every time I went, it was really inspiring. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great group, definitely. So let's talk about how you were, how you became the first, uh, first human, as far as I know, uh, to run across Kansas. <laughs> so, you know, you, the way my brain works is I always have these little seeds in the back of my head and I'm always like, mm -hmm. oh, if I could ever have time to do this or I could do this or I would do this and you know, sometimes those seeds, you just water slowly and they grow into something beautiful. And sometimes they just, you don't water them and they fade and they die and it's okay. Um, and at any given time, I probably have, I mean, you know, a hundred, I think there are a lot of people that are, that are like that. And Kansas was always one of, one of those, those seeds, if you will. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it kind of came around where um, the, the summer had aligned and my kids schedule and with everything and then my wife, it all aligned to where I was like, Hey, I can, I can run across Kansas this fall. Mm -hmm. Um, why Kansas, you know, it was part of it was just, it's there. I mean, that's why we run any race. Um, the other thing was it was close enough to home, but it, it was, it was for lack of a better term, it was epic enough. It was big enough to what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, I also knew that it would probably get me into one of the races that I had been looking at since really the first months of my running um, hobby is Badwater. And I, I knew that if I could do something like that, that really it would strengthen my application so I could get into that race. Um, and so I recruited my dad, my father-in-law, and a really good friend of mine and said, Hey, you know, if you guys aren't doing anything around October, uh, how would you guys like to crew the, the run across Kansas? And, you know, they're like, you're crazy. You can't run, a, you know, along I-70. I'm like, I know, I know there's other ways we can do it. And so really in about, I think it was probably July or August, uh, of that year, we started to really plan the route. Um, we camped uh, along and um, hit state parks in, in the state of Kansas. And those were kind of our home bases. And so we'd go, you know, roughly about 50 miles either way from that. And we'd pack up and, and then go down 50 miles and then kind of on the state. Uh, and so, yeah, that was it. You know, it was, uh, it was an interesting ride. Uh, we had a lot of fun and, uh, you go through a full range of emotions. It's, it's, uh, it's an indescribable feeling, both, you know, the highs and the lows. Um, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. So you, and, you know, 10 miles later. Yeah, so so you were keeping a pace of over, you know, like 40 miles a day, uh, took you about 10 days. I mean, over a marathon a day for 10 days in a row, I mean, that is just grueling. I, I have no idea how, uh, how you did that. Um, oh, so one of the things that they were talking about on the Wisconsin Notes podcast was, uh, I think she said FKT or OKT. I had to go FKT, look that up. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, uh, so first known, first known time or fastest known time, right? Fastest known time. Yeah. There you go. All so right. and so, I just kind of looking at the Kansas map, I kind of assumed that you did just run along I seventy, but it sounds like you took some back roads whenever possible and things like that. 
Yeah, so what we did is we actually took a state highway north, um, and it runs virtually parallel to I-70. I mean, it varies distance. Um, for the first stretch, it's pretty close to I-70, and then it slowly veers away. And then in Topeka, it gets super close. And then as you come into the city, then it essentially turns into what is State Avenue. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's 24 is was the uh, the the highway the route. So yeah, there was there was much less traffic. Obviously, it wasn't as uh, the traffic that was on there wasn't as fast out in western Kansas. Unfortunately, it was harvest season, so there was a lot of semi traffic, which was uh, interesting to to deal with. Uh, just kicked up a bunch of dirt and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, and uh, but it was good. We survived and we got through it, and yeah, we we got it done. That's awesome. So I I have never clearly uh, you know filled out one of these applications for one of these runs or something. And I honestly I didn't know that you uh, were you had your eyes on at this, at that point you had your eyes on the bad water. 135 and so you put this run across Kansas on the application and uh, you know clearly it helped because you got there and this was uh, remind me was this last year or the year before it was last year yep okay awesome and so you you actually start in Death Valley at the lowest point in the US right and then you climb it's almost like you're um, you're running up a mountain the whole time, and then the the cherry on top at the end is that you're essentially run uh, you know walked walking or running right up a mountain. Tell us more about how that was. <laughs> right. So the the race is no, or it's considered the toughest foot race in the world. Yes. Uh, like you said, you start in Death Valley, the lowest point in the United States, and you actually go to the almost the highest point in the contiguous United States, which is uh, the portal of Mount Whitney. And the portal is kind of that, the very beginning of what climbers and hikers and runners uh, do to get to the summit of Mount Whitney. Wow. And so we, we go to the virtual very top. Um, you obviously run it at the hottest time of the year, which is July. And temps get anywhere uh, up to 130, you know, plus degrees. Uh, and yeah, so you got to figure out a way to get 135 miles uh, across the desert. And so you experience everything. Um, my race was very difficult at first. Uh, and I dealt with some stomach issues, um, some dehydration and uh, barely made the cutoff. So they put cutoffs in there to make sure for safety reasons and those sorts of things. Right. And so I barely made the cutoff, uh, the first one, and was able to kind of survive through that. Then uh, made really the first climb. You go through three mountain ranges. Um, and so the first climb was difficult. I think that was the most difficult point in the race for me. I had just completed uh, roughly 50 some miles. It was the heat of the day. You know, I had been vomiting and other stuff uh, you can imagine. And so I had, I was done, but by the grace of my team and the, you know, the four of them, um, they really, they, they're what kept me in the race and ultra running really doesn't, get probably as much credit as it should as far as a, a team sport right you know you, you as the runner are obviously the one that completes the race but especially in bad water your teammates they have gone through all the training because you have a pacer so somebody to make sure that they kind of guides you help guide you mm -hmm. um, they help keep you um, cold your body temp low they spray you down um, and they just make sure that you're taken care of but they've also had to train as well because they're running side by side right next to you. Right. And so, um, 
so yeah, those, the, those four really saved, you know, Jesse, Steve, Pam, and my dad, they all really saved the race for me at that point and really did a good job just talking me through everything. And, you know, w- when you, when you put that kind of stress on your body, it, it doesn't, it, it, it starts affecting you mentally as well. And really that's, that's where, that's where the game, the race, um, your finish, everything, that's really where, that's the heart of the race itself is, is the mind game and really overpowering your brain and telling them, you know, you are okay. You're nothing's wrong. You're just in this. Um, I always call it the hamster wheel of just pain. And so you get so caught up in what's going on with you. You don't step outside of that and allow the real information to come in because you're just so concerned you know, I've got blisters, I'm dehydrated, my feet, you know. Uh, and so that's a lot of what, you know, any of those uber long distance, any race, I mean, really, is really, it's, it's, it's a lot of mind over matter. It's teaching your body that you can endure and teaching your brain that, you know, you'll come out on the other side, right. maybe hobbling and, and, you know, but, but you'll make it. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So you, Sorry, the, the closest thing I've done to that I can compare to running a marathon is probably um, a, a fast, honestly, because it's that same mental uh, mind over matter where you your body thinks you are completely starving uh, and your mind is just constantly thinking about food. I, I could imagine you're just constantly thinking about your feet or whatever you're feeling uh, while you're running, but that is just such a uh, such a long run, you know. And actually, kind of what you said is, is you know, in anything, the end result, but more so, you have to be in love with the process getting you there. And so, you know, it just seems like for the last ten years, I've always just been it's in the process. It's, I'm always in the process. You know, there'll be three days a year where I actually have the race, but other than that, just, you know, and so it all kind of blends together and it's this weird timeline of Boston ultras, bad water, you know, Kansas. And so. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, through listening to that podcast again, I learned that you are a low mileage trainer. So, uh, so you train fairly low mileage, and then when you go to the race, you're running uh, much longer than you have when you train. Uh, so to me, that means that uh, these ultra races are really, there's a lot of mental, I mean, clearly physical is part of it too, but uh, you know, you've, you've proven that your body has been able to withstand these, but the mental aspect just has to be huge when you're looking at one of these races. Definitely. And it's, it is, you, you have to, you have to have a certain sense of confidence, but that has to be equaled by as much humbleness. Right. Because if, if not, you, you will get eaten alive. I mean, that's what I tell people is, you know, if you go in and you're just like, Oh, I can do this. You know, I've seen people do it. You know, I've been at start lines with, with folks who just, you know, you can just, they're just talking and, you know, I'm going to do this and this, and then 30 miles in, they're the first one out. Uh, right. And so, you, and, and, and it's, it's not because they're bad or anything. It's just, if you set that, if you're overconfident, the second you hit any sort of um, misstep, it just crushes you because, you know, you're like, wait a second, what? Like, um, Right. And so, yeah, definitely. I mean, the mental, I am equally in love with the mental aspect of running as I am the actual physical doing, you know, of running. Um, it's, yeah. it's what, yeah, it's what separates a lot of people, you know. So it sounds like from listening again to that podcast that you um, and your teammates at the Badwater were really kind of breaking it into chunks and um, using baby steps and micro goals and then 
also kind of using those celebrations when you whenever you achieve one of those baby steps or those micro goals using kind of that celebration to carry you through the pain of persevering along this race is that is that pretty accurate yeah i mean i think that's that's a great comparison i mean yeah you're spot on um you know and it's funny as as long as i've done this like i've never really I mean, I've done it subconsciously, but I've never analyzed it in that manner. And you're right. I mean, it's, you just, you got to celebrate. Sometimes you just got to celebrate even at every win, even right. if it's just waking up in the morning and getting out the door and running a mile. I mean, that's exactly. better than, you know, the alternative, which was you sleeping in and not doing anything. Um, right. I think, you know, we, you had mentioned, uh, the gifts that running had given me and, and really the thing that running and, and bad water in general is, is that we just, we crush ourselves so hard when we don't achieve this, these goals. And what we don't realize is that it's, it's a process like, yeah, you're not going to get it right the first time. Yeah. You're going to fail. But when that happens, like be kind to yourself. You know, realize that are, there are days where you just, you're not going to be there, but that's okay. Right. Um, and I think for me in, in Badwater, really the tipping point of the race where uh, it was that pressure was relieved when my teammates told me that, you know, and they really said, hey, man, and they looked back from where I came and they looked forward mm -hmm. where I was going. Right. And they said, you know, you've endured this and you know, you're here and what's the worst that, that can happen? Like you're alive. <laughs> uh, but sometimes you need somebody to, to shake you and you need somebody to tell you that. Right. And we don't always, we don't always have those people. And so you have to be your biggest advocate. Um, you know, I read a quote when I got back from Badwater and it was like, it, it was talking about self-reflection and how you treat yourself. And, and one of the things was, you know, if you treated you, if you had a friend that treated you the way you treat yourself, would you be friends with that person? Right. And that's really just a great question to ask yourself when you are crushing yourself over not doing something, you know, and for those that are getting started in a routine, whether it's exercise or diet or just overall well being, like, I'm here to tell you, you're going to screw up. Like, Yes, it, it, it's, you're gonna fail, um, but it's okay. It's part of the process. Don't let it diminish where you're going. Don't let it stop you. Stay steadfast. I promise you that, you know, you, the, the end is totally worth it. Um, and yeah, those times you fall, like soothe yourself, realize it's gonna be okay, and get back up and just keep moving. Right. Exactly. I, and positive self-talk is just so. Uh, so important when you're enduring those uh, those low times. So I've um, I've got a question for you based on essentially I, I've just noticed that there are a lot of endurance athletes that are also uh, very successful, and I was wondering what you think that connection is. What does that have to do with? Is it the consistency? and the focus or uh, you know that blood flow to the brain um, you know are you having epiphanies that uh, that promote success while you're running or um, the endorphins what do you, what do you think um, explains that connection between endurance and ultra endurance athletes and success in life you know, I think that, um, one, uh, it's, it's, I'm a moderately successful guy. So, you know, you're taking, you take a, my, my opinion. Um, there's a lot of guys, you know, like rich and, and Dean and, and all these ultra athletes who really probably can, can boil it down a lot better than I can. But I think for me, really what has helped is you just, you view your life and any goal that you have on a much longer time horizon, hmm. you know, and, and, and you realize that you don't wake up successful. Like you just chip away at it each and every single day. And that's what, a, that's, that's what an ultra race is. You know, 
an ultra race is in, it's not like you wake up and you've run a hundred miles. It's just, you just do one mile mm -hmm. as it comes every single, you know, second. And it's the same way with success. You've got, you just got to show up, but you got to show up every single day. And it doesn't mean you show up every day, a hundred percent, you know, it means you just show up and, and that kind of hand in hand with it is, is that, you know, a lot of success is just showing up. Um, yes. You know, and in my business career in general, um, and I think uh, that is very parallel to endurance sports, um, especially ultra endurance sports, where if you're going to do day in and day out. So you've spoken about the gifts that running has given you. Uh, can you share a few of those? Uh, I know one of them has to be the amount of time that you've been able to spend with your dad on your crew and. Uh, Tell us if there are any others you'd like to share. That'd be awesome to hear those too. Um, you know, it's given me my health, which has in turn given me um, a great relationship uh, with my family because I'm able to play with my kids like I could. I mean, I'm in better shape now than I was in my 20s. I mean, you knew me in my right. 20s. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and so I'm in much better shape. I'm able to do things that, uh, uh, you know, some parents just can't do because of physically they just can't do it. Uh, and so that's been a huge gift. Um, you know, the huge gift of patience and perspective and, and a lot of the things that we just talked about. Um, obviously, the relationship with my dad that has really blossomed uh, more than ever because of our uh, you know, you're in those trenches together, enduring uh, some of the toughest things that uh, you could really voluntarily expose yourself to. <laughs> and by doing that, you know, you really forge a relationship. Um, and not that we didn't have one before. I mean, we've always been close, but this really brought us together uh, much more, much more so. Um, you know, it's given me the gift of being able to do things like this and NP and um, just speaking, you know, to people about my story. And um, that's been a great learning experience for me. I've enjoyed it. Uh, and it really has, uh, has helped um, just all avenues, really my professional career. I mean, it's helped a lot just because I come to work and I've trained in the morning and I'm just focused, you know, Yes. I mean, you know how it is when you work out in the morning or you do some sort of act, physical activity in the morning, I mean, you're just that much more honed and ready to go, yes. um, which is definitely translated on that end as well. So, yeah, that's awesome. So, and I've made a ton of great friends. I mean, yes. I have so many friends now from running that uh, I would have never been exposed to had I not been running. So that's definitely yes. worth it. That's really cool. Um, so 10 years ago, when you started running on your elliptical in your garage, did you, you know, your at that time, your goal was to lose weight. Could you imagine that you had become the first man to run across Kansas and run these multiple hundred mile races? Too many to, to remember? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it was just, it, it, it's just a journey that, I was willing to take the leap. I knew where I needed to go. I just needed that push. And really the thought of having kids without their dad really is what kind of pushed me over the edge. Right. Um, but I never knew that it would, it would take me here. And it's been an amazing ride. And the next 10 years, I hope are equally, if not more so, um, you know, we have, uh, Unfortunately, due to COVID and everything like that, I was lucky enough to be accepted into Badwater again this year. But with COVID and everything, I deferred till next year. So I'll be running it next year. And then nice. who knows, working on some things this fall. Um, and so we'll see what happens there. And we just, you know, keep moving ahead. Yeah, I was wondering that. Do you still run, um, you know, some of these shorter races like Kansas City Marathon or, um, you know, just some of these local shorter races or do you uh are you always you always have your eye on the the big prize no i run local races i i do enjoy them 
it's tough whenever um, I have like a big race planned and then trying to weave those in there. Right. Um, sure. Kansas, Kansas has some great last fall. I did a 24 hour race. Um, Kansas does have some great ultra running and it isn't that, you know, I'm a, have anything against running in Kansas or anything like that. It just, you know, with, with, sometimes you're attracted to some of those bigger races. Yes. Um, some of the more, more well-known things, but yeah, I've run races locally. I try to interweave those with my, my training as much as I can for sure. Right. If I'm not mistaken, I believe you took first place in that 24 hour race in Kansas. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I got, yes, I did. Um, nice. you know, the hope was to, uh, to break the Kansas state record, which I did not do. Ooh, uh, I remember the wheels that started. now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The wheels kind of fell apart uh, halfway through the night. Uh, sunset, and it got just so cold, and it just really ate me up. And and it's tough. The type of runner I am, I'm a better uh, chaser than I am a leader as far as pushing it. Uh, okay. And so once I had the – I knew I had the race one, it was just really tough to push to try to get to that record. And I think I missed it by, like, about a – 13 miles which seems like a lot but really in an ultra at 13 miles it's 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 not much <laughs> right yeah. awesome very cool well yeah I, I find myself repeating pretty often to never underestimate your health potential and I find that uh, you know the timing is great for this men's health week men especially are really quick to say Oh, I could never do that. You know, I could never, um, I could never do blank. And uh, I'm sure you've had friends who have said things like that. And uh, I'm sure that's probably what you were thinking when you were on your elliptical in your basement uh, a long time ago. But, you know, lots of things are possible. And so that's my advice to most men and, and anyone who is starting a new routine or a new uh, a new goal, a new health practice is to never underestimate that health potential. Yeah, I mean, you're right. We are all, we ha we all have just so much untapped potential in us. Yes. It's just, it's just being able to just go there and you'd be surprised once you, you start going there, how much of that you can really harness and, and, and get together and, and really push ahead. It's, it's amazing. I mean, us as humans have a, a real amazing capability to do some, some great things. It's just having the confidence to make that first step. And you're right. You know, I hope somebody that's listening to this right now, I'm telling you from a guy who, <laughs> who is overweight with smoking. I mean, it's a cliche, but at the same time, you know, you got it in you. You know, you just got to be willing to make that first step. And so I encourage you to, uh, to give it a go for sure. Awesome, man. Thanks so much for joining me today. Um, you've inspired thousands of people. Just keep on doing the awesome work and take care and stay safe, man. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, buddy. I really appreciate you having me on. Awesome. Thanks, John. Yeah. Yeah.